being is a verb. The linking of motion with existence is one of the most valuable insights of the living patristic tradition and a departure from most strands of Hellenic philosophy. As St. Maximus the Confessor says, quoting St. Dionysius the Areopagite at the end, the only valid proof that this essence is present in its entirety, moreover, is its natural constitutive power, which one would not be mistaken in calling a natural energy, properly and primarily characteristic of the nature in question, since it's the most generic motion constitutive of a species, and contains every property that naturally belongs to the essence, apart from which there is only non-being, since only that which has absolutely no being whatsoever, according to that great teacher, has neither motion nor existence." Unquote. Both Dionysius and Maximus and the fathers in general, identify motion with existence, an understanding that has natural implications for Trinitarian theology. If movement is essential to existence, and God exists, then God must, in some sense, be in motion. God's natural motion cannot be towards something other than himself. Otherwise, he would be essentially dependent upon something beyond him, and wouldn't be God by the biblical, patristic, and orthodox definition. God is, indeed, in motion, but his motion is the divine life of the Trinity, a motion beyond time. Time. The motion of God is precisely an intra-Trinitarian movement, and according to Father Nicolos Ludovicos, this movement constitutes the consubstantiality of the persons. Quote, Maximus, in continuity with the Cappadocians, speaks of a sort of movement of nature within the Trinity but which, nevertheless, doesn't imply time. And this is precisely what constitutes homoousion. Concerning divine essence, the confessor avers that though it stays in immovable rest, the divine essence seems to move, moving towards each other. So homoousion is a timeless intra-Trinitarian movement, it's an affirmation by the Son of his nature as the Father's nature, an affirmation by the Spirit of his nature as the Father's nature, and a reciprocal affirmation by the Son and the Spirit of their essence as that of the Father's together with each other's, timelessly following the causal affirmation made by the Father of his nature as the Son's and the Spirit's nature through generation and epichoresis." Unquote. Without getting into the fascinating but dangerous territory of speculating about the specific meaning and implications, of every theological term Father Ludovicos employs, what's essential to note is that it's legitimate to speak of an intra-Trinitarian movement that specifically relates to their consubstantiality and perichoresis. Again, without getting into specific and debatable definitions, we should note that the dogmas of consubstantiality and perichoresis further reveal the communal nature of God and, by implication, the world he created. God isn't self-enclosed because he's an eternal communion of three persons wherein each knows the other with the third. The Father glorifies the Son, and so does the Spirit. The Son glorifies the Father, and so does the Spirit. Each glorifies the other two together, but their glorification of the other two implicitly affirms their own unique position within the unity, and thus it's always already a tri-unity. There is a sense in which the Father affirms himself as the Father precisely because self-affirmation isn't equal to self-relation, but to the perfect realization of communion. The eternal begetting of the Son and the distinct but eternally related procession of the Spirit from the Father is the homoousion of which Father Ludovico speaks above. I also personally understand the perichoresis of the persons as related and mutually interior to consubstantiality, but distinct insofar as perichoresis specifically describes the mutual interiority of the three persons who each actualize the one divine essence and the energies of that essence in their unique hypostatic ways, that is, as three distinct persons within a single communion. Consubstantiality is the eternal timeless movement of the Father's nature, as it's actualized in the begetting of the Son and the spiration of the Spirit. The unity of nature is fully realized in the perfect union of the three persons. The key point is that the perfect relation of the three persons is fully actualized in the union of nature despite both being distinct. It's precisely because the Father, Son, and Spirit eternally share the same nature that they're of one mind, will, and activity, eternally performing the same act this act being of and proper to the essence, in perfect harmony, a harmony that necessitates the distinction of the three persons. Because of the threefold distinction of the persons, the eternal motion of consubstantiality is possible. Since being is an energy of God, and the energies of God are the natural properties, or activities, or actualities, or names of the divine essence, then we know that being is intrinsically connected to motion, as the divine energies refer to the infinitely diverse, yet perfectly united and mutually interior inner life of God. God. 
For this reason, the energy is both one and many, of course, in different respects. I suggest that the energy is one insofar as there's a single intratrinitarian life, and this life is life as such, so that every other existence is predicated upon participation in it. However, since we know that where there's no distinction, there can be no abundance or fruitfulness, and since we know God is infinitely abundant and fruitful, we know that there must be a legitimate sense in which one can speak of an infinite plurality of divine energies. But the distinction between the energies can't be the same as the distinction of the persons, as their distinction is based on an incommunicable hypostatic property unique to each person. In contrast, every energy is fully communicable and always already communicated to each other as they're natural to the shared divine essence. Thus, one can say being is love and vice versa, but one cannot say the same thing about the Father, Son, and Spirit. I've yet to fully understand this topic, but I've received positive feedback from people I trust, most significantly Dr. David Bradshaw. The energies doctrine as a whole requires much theological clarification, and thankfully many great scholars have made significant advancements in the past 20 years, including the aforementioned David Bradshaw. To continue with the theme of the previous two videos, I want to now relate what we've established concerning Trinitarian theology to anthropology in the widest ontological sense of that term. Since mankind is made in the image of God, anthropology is necessarily ontological. Mankind, as male and female, is the image of God created in in the image and likeness of God. We are like God insofar as the unity of our one human nature is actualized through the realization of a proper hierarchy, which is simply another way of saying communion. Communion is always hierarchical because it involves distinct persons with distinct roles within the union. The Father moves towards the Son eternally, and the Son reciprocates. These are two distinct yet eternally interrelated roles. This divine mystery, revealed in Christ, is the archetype of all relations, specifically the relation of husband to bride. Adam is created by God first, and God gave him the law, the commandment not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God then says that it's not good for man to be alone, so he creates Eve from his side. Eve is created from Adam and, analogously, the Son is born from the Father from all eternity. Adam loves Eve and she loves him back. While Adam is first, this doesn't make Eve passive, nor does it make him superior. On the contrary, Adam being the first means he is protological, while Eve being built by God out of his original creation means she is eschatological. This is why the Virgin Mary is the highest of the saints, as she is the feminine bride who fully completes God God's task of building a house for himself to dwell in, a house that is equally a spouse, i.e. an active yet secondary and reciprocating partner. Both the sexes, male and female, are meant to become feminized in relation to God, but in their distinct ways. In the context of the Genesis narrative, Adam was meant to fulfill his duty of protecting the garden and everything within it, including his bride, so that he could be crowned as high priest and king over creation. But Adam failed to do his duty when he allowed his bride to be deceived by the serpent. Contrary to the popular misunderstanding that the Bible blames Eve for the fall and not Adam, it's clear from both the Genesis narrative and the wider biblical context that Adam is the one who's primarily at fault. This is based on the biblical principle that culpability for sin is directly proportional to one's knowledge of the law of God. Paul claims he was forgiven for persecuting the church because he acted in ignorance. Adam received the law directly from God, while Eve could only have received it from Adam, as God gave the commandment before her creation. So she, like Paul, acted with ignorance, at least in relation to Adam. With all of this established concerning the image of God, I want to emphasize the fundamental point that the purpose of humanity is to be feminized in relation to God, which consists specifically of our becoming built as the dwelling place or house or bride of God. This is theosis. Many great theologians believe that the incarnation of the Word wasn't contingent upon man's fall, but was part of God's eternal plan for creation. So, Adam and Eve didn't have to sin in the garden, and God had a plan for them if they hadn't. Specifically in the context of the early Genesis narrative, I suggest that Adam on the evening of the sixth day was meant to guide Eve into Sabbath rest on the seventh. The Sabbath is the day of union between God and man, symbolized by the eating of the tree of life. The ultimate realization of the union between God and man is the latter's ecstasis into God, wherein both male and female together are adopted into the eternal Son of God by grace. This union is eschatological. Protological history consists of Eve's original being built from the side of man and man's fulfillment of his masculine role in guiding his bride towards fulfilling both of their purposes, i.e. the begetting of children together 
and glorifying God. Both play distinct yet mutually constituting roles in realizing these purposes. Eve is eschatological because the seed, who once again we believe was to come within a non-fallen chronology, the seed comes from her. But of course, she comes from Adam, who comes from God. Christ, as both the seed, the man, and God, perfectly fulfills his role as the last Adam, who guides his bride, who before the incarnation is barren, into union with his father, which is the precondition of her spiritual fertility. Adam's separation into two parts is a necessary step in his transformation into the likeness of God. While it may seem to be a paradoxical idea that Adam could become more fully himself, i.e. fulfill his good, through being divided in two, we have no reason to believe this is a contradiction if we understand that creation is entirely contingent upon God. If creation doesn't find its principle of existence within itself, that means that it's entirely contingent upon God. Since no created being possesses existence in itself, self-directed motion would necessarily be contrary to the ontological constitution of every creature. Thus, the communal nature of being seems to be a logical necessity of the doctrine of creation. Since our investigations are based on the revelation of God in Christ, we can now understand that Adam's division in two, the creation of a distinct self from his self, is an intrinsic aspect of his imaging God. Just as the Father has eternally begotten the Son, Adam submitted to God and allowed him to build another from his own self. And if we agree that man truly is the image of the triune God, and that we're meant to be fully conformed to his likeness, then it seems to follow that intrinsic to the purpose of the union of the two is the ecstasis of their mutual love, their fruitfulness and multiplication, just as the love of the Father and the Son eternally flows out and is shared in by the Spirit. Eve was created for Adam so that the two could become one and fulfill their unity in the third. This third is symbolically and protologically their children, and spiritually and eschatologically, Christ. The most significant point is that man's separation into male and female is an intrinsic aspect of his telos, and it signifies the distinction between persons necessary for any communion, and teleology is communal. And since, as we know from the previous video, teleology and ontology are mutually interior, we can also speak of Adam's existence being further realized or actualized in his division into two. Peter Lightheart recently tweeted the following, quote, When man is separated into male and female, he ceases to be self-enclosed in his isolation. Adam's body literally opens so Yahweh can build another like opposite him. That's an advance in godliness, for like the creator, man is himself as he makes room for another. Man is himself as he makes room for another, is seemingly an antinomy. It's only an antinomy if one applies fallen standards to eschatological events, even events which merely symbolize the eschaton, like Eve being built from Adam's side. Man is, quite literally, fulfilling his purpose, his reason, his telos and logi, when he makes room for another, as the logi are the divine ideas or purposes related to creatures, and everything within the divine mind is communal, as God is communion. I'll end with a quote from Sarah from Hamilton. God creates man by taking counsel with himself as a triune unity. Let us make man in our image. It is because the one God is a plural unity whose unity is realized and manifested in his diversity that the one image of God is also a plural unity, constituted in the communion of bridegroom, bride, and offspring. Each person contains the entirety of human nature, but the intrinsic potencies of this nature cannot be actualized except in communion with other persons of the same nature. This is why Adam's being alone is not not good. Eve is of the same nature as Adam, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, language used for fraternal relations, thus the biblical theme of the sister bride, as in the Song of Songs, my sister, my bride. The woman, bone from the side of man, shares his nature and is joined to him in becoming one flesh. This is the means by which human nature is developed and matured, division and reintegration in glorified form. One divides the sacrificial animal, then glory fire consumes it as a single cloud of smoke.